Uh, I would like to move on to our next speaker, Dr. John Wery, who is the Richard and Barbara Shifflin Presidential uh, Professor of Pharmacology. He also serves as the chair of the Department of System Pharmacology and Trans Translational Therapeutics and is the director of the Institute of Immunology. He's going to talk to us about uh, really innovative science about immuno immune profiling in patients with COVID-19 and his breakthrough research during during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, welcome, John. Thanks, Charu, uh, and thanks for putting together a wonderful conference and for the invitation to present. So I wanna talk just briefly about the immune responses in COVID-19 patients and describe some of our recent results, uh, some of which were published and some of which uh, have just been submitted. Um, so uh, I have some disclosures, uh, none of which are, are relevant to the studies that I'll present. So what do we know about COVID-19 immunology? We've heard a little bit of this from Dr. Fauci and others so far. Um, we uh, know that there's an elevated inflammatory response and we've heard a little bit about how this may impact some of the vascular manifestations and also some of the immunopathology that may occur. But we also know that there are mixed responses to anti-inflammatories. And we heard this uh, already about dexamethasone, perhaps not having a benefit and maybe even causing harm if treated too early in disease or in patients um, uh, with not as severe inflammatory symptoms. We have good evidence in the literature of T-cell activation in some patients, but there's also evidence of perhaps T-cell hypofunction or T-cell exhaustion in the literature. And so uh, we don't really know which way the immune response is going in a given patient. We know that there's long-term serological immunity in some patients, um, and there's starting to be emerging evidence of cellular immunity, that is uh, memory T cells in some patients that recover from disease. But we really don't understand the relationship yet to the acute immune responses. There have been some associations proposed between the severity of acute disease and perhaps durability of serological memory or impacts on cellular memory, but it's unclear exactly how those relationships pan out. We also understand relatively little about the temporal kinetics of disease. And I'm not gonna talk very much about the innate immune response, but, but certainly there's emerging data suggesting that differences in the innate immune response and interferon pathways may impact the ability to mount adaptive immune responses. But in general, uh, we still don't understand the temporal kinetics of the immune response because we don't really understand the temporal kinetics of infection pathogenesis and disease very well. We do know that there are uh, antibody producing plasma blasts that are found in the blood of acutely ill patients. Um, and uh, most of our hospitalized patients actually do have antibody, um, many when they present to the hospital, but yet these patients are still sick uh, and convalescent plasma or antibody therapies show promise anecdotally, but you just heard uh, that on larger trials, uh, some of these studies still um, have um, sort of mixed outcomes and the benefit is unclear. So it's not entirely clear why patients have antibodies and when adding additional antibodies uh, to these patients might provide benefit. We also really don't yet understand why children aren't as, aren't as sick as most adults and, and whether they respond the same way to COVID-19 disease or SARS-CoV-2 infection. So the bottom line is that we're still searching for trying to understand what a typical immune response to, to SARS-CoV-2 infection is in COVID-19 patients. So in late March, uh, working with several partners on campus, we decided to build a, a translational immunology profiling pipeline, uh, really adapted from our work in cancer immunotherapy and, and turn that engine towards COVID-19 patients. We have amazing partners in critical care, including Nula Meyer, who uh, really was instrumental in getting these studies off the ground and who also treated many of the patients uh, who we studied for, for immunology and virology. Uh, we also partnered with Mike Betts early on um, to, uh, to build this profiling pipeline and enlisting many of the key scientists in our labs here who ended up being uh, first authors on several papers that came out of this work. We acquired samples, processed them, and then fed them into what we're calling a deep immune profiling pipeline. And I'm gonna show you, show you mainly flow cytometry data from this pipeline uh, today, uh, but there are many other platforms that are currently being used. What I wanna describe just in a couple of slides is a cohort that we developed, again, starting in late March, and, and really what the analysis I'm gonna show you is patients that were recruited into this cohort until about mid-May, the cohort's still recruiting. Uh, but the analysis that I'll show you stopped at 150, 149 uh, hospitalized COVID patients, most of whom were ICU, but some were floor patients. 125 of those we have deep uh, immune profiling data on. But we compared these COVID-19 patients to a, a cohort of recovered donors, 
who are at least two weeks from last symptom uh, and also to healthy donors. Now the cohorts are not perfectly age matched in the pandemic, it was difficult to do that, but they're, they're at least overlapping. Uh, they are gender balanced and matched for other things uh, to the extent that we could match them. So one of the things we wanted to do was ask what the immune response looks like in these patients. And we started out um, using a baseline of our understanding of antiviral immune responses in humans, and especially CD8 T cell responses, because those T cells are important for intracellular pathogens and viruses. And we used a trick that has been used to study antiviral immune responses in HIV infected patients, influenza infected patients, or patients receiving live attenuated vaccines. And that is to uh, use these markers, a marker called CD38 in combination with HLA-DR and use upregulation of both markers to identify uh, putative virus specific T cell responses. Now in those other settings, many people have shown that virus specific T cells during acute infection upregulate both of these markers and can be identified in this sort of quadrant of the flow cytometry gate in the upper right. Now what you see here is in healthy donors or even the recovered donors, there's very little baseline CD8 T cell activation, but in our COVID-19 patients, you see stark activation of CD8 T cells. In some cases, uh, whether you use these markers or other markers of activation, more than a third and sometimes even higher than 50% of the circulating CD8 T cells are highly activated in ways that suggest we have an antiviral T cell response. But you'll also notice there are other COVID-19 patients that actually look indistinguishable from our healthy controls. And in fact, the green line here indicates the 90th percentile of our healthy controls. And you'll see that there are at least some COVID-19 patients that seem not to have a T cell activation profile. You can do this in higher dimensional space. And we're looking at uh, just under 30 different markers by flow cytometry here. And you can then project that high dimensional data in various ways and get essentially a landscape map for how the overall T cell compartment has been perturbed by SARS-CoV-2 infection in these COVID-19 patients. And what you'll see is that heat map of the um, diversity of, of the activation profile in CD8 T cells is actually pretty similar between the healthy donors and the recovered donors. There's some subtleties here that I'm happy to discuss. But in the COVID-19 patients, you see a massive reorganization of the T cell activation profiles. And in fact, a lot of this activation phenotype of these CD38 HLA-DR cells is right down this sort of middle valley here. And you can pick this apart and look at the different sort of regions of these maps. And those different regions actually tell you something about the biology of the T cells that are responding. And you can pick through this a little bit more to figure out which kinds of T cells are responding. And importantly, in which patients, because we have about 50 or 60 parameters of clinical data on these patients. What we learned from this is that there's a tremendous activation of CD8 and CD4 T cells in most COVID-19 patients. This activation profile is similar to or higher than what we see in many other acute viral infections. We see activated CD8 T cells, but actually a particular type of effector CD8 T cells that those that express markers like uh, the transcription factor TBET or other, uh, other molecules are actually relatively low despite this activation. In contrast on the CD4 T cell side, that activation subset is highly enriched and in fact is more abundant than you find in normal, um, in normal settings. We also see an altered or a uh, lower percentage of uh, these so-called circulating follicular helper cells that help these cells make antibody. Um, and this is interesting considering the type of humoral response that we see in some patients. So that led us to try to understand what was happening on the B cell side of the equation. And if you look in these acutely infected patients at their B cell compartment, what you find is a, an incredibly robust response of circulating plasma blasts in the blood of these patients. In normal healthy humans, you see very few if any circulating plasma blasts. These are cells that are, are typically coming out of germinal centers. Their job is simply to make antibody. Once the germinal center response has started to calm down, these cells exit and they're present in the blood for a very short period of time on their way to the bone marrow where, where they will set up residence for the, the rest of their life. Now, this kind of peak of a plasma blast response uh, is indicative of making a robust antibody response. Uh, and you can see that sometimes we have 30, even 40% of your circulating B cells are these plasma blasts. Not in all patients again. And again, you see some patients down here below the screen line. But to put this in context, what you see if you're acutely infected with influenza virus is something in the range of maybe 10 to 15% of your circulating B cells would be in this plasma blast compartment. In patients that are acutely infected with Ebola, the last time we had Ebola patients in the US, 
uh, you see that there you can start to get to the range that we see in COVID-19 uh, patients um, uh, in, in the hospital. So this is an extraordinarily high percentage of circulating plasma blasts that suggests that there's some ongoing B cell response occurring. And in fact, you can look, there are antibodies to the SARS-CoV-2 spike in most of these patients. The plasma blast response does not correlate with that circulating antibody response just to the spike protein. That may be because many of these plasma blasts are also making antibodies to other parts of the coronavirus, the nucleoprotein or other proteins, or because there's some bystander activation of plasma blasts because of the inflammatory response. Now, we collected a lot of immunological data. In fact, we had 550 discrete immune features, um, and we also collected about 50 clinical features. That's very difficult to look at in two-dimensional space like the data I was just showing you. So we built a mapping uh, algorithm to actually project all of that information in two-dimensional space and also relate it to disease severity. And what you're seeing here is the aggregate signal of immune features that give you a, a horizontal component, component one, and immune features that contribute to the diversity of the patient response in component two. And you can see a little bit that there's more severe patients on the right-hand side of this uh, as the, the symbols get darker and the triangles are patients who succumb to disease. And indeed, if you look at the relationship between this component one, this composite immune signature in the horizontal direction, there is a relationship between an increase in component one and more severe disease. In fact, you can project back onto this map individual features of the immune response. So CD4 T cell activation actually contributes to both component one and component two, whereas that unusual uh, effector-like population that I said was low in COVID-19 patients actually really is only contributing to the patient's um, immune features uh, in, the heart, in the vertical direction, so component two, but not contributing in the horizontal direction. And overall, what this led us to was the realization that there are different immunotypes of response. There are patients that actually are, are very driven by this horizontal feature, which is activated CD4 and CD8 T cells, these effector-like CD4 T cells that also express this chemokine receptor, CX3CR1, and that have a very robust plasma blast response. This immune feature correlated very strongly with disease severity. In the vertical direction, however, we have different immune features. We have this effector-like CD8 T cell population, but not the effector CD4 T cell population, and proliferating B cells. We also see a more coordinated immune response in this vertical direction for component two. That component two is not associated with disease severity. Interesting low, interestingly though, you do see that there are patients who succumb to disease all around this map are relating immune features to disease severity. Now, I kept pointing out on the previous slides, uh, these patients that actually sit below this green line. And indeed, about 15 to 20% of the COVID-19 patients who are hospitalized with severe disease have very little evidence of immune activation, that is T cell or plasma blast activation. So we wanted to ask, where do those patients fall on this map of immune features? And they actually fall in this region sort of uh, in, in the middle, but a little bit on the lower side. And in fact, their immune features are negatively correlated with this component one or component two or disease severity over time. Yet at least one of these patients still succumb to disease. These patients, many of them, not all of them, have antibody to the SARS-CoV-2 spike in the hospital. So it's not that they have no immune activation whatsoever, or that antibody is actually a residual cross-reactive antibody from previous coronavirus infections. We don't know the answer to that yet. But this gives us the picture that there are three different ways that the adaptive immune response can manifest a, a, a reaction to SARS-CoV-2. Um, we have one that is a very robust, highly activated, and maybe imbalanced immune responses in immunotype one, a more balanced immune response where you have activation of CD4s and CD8 T cells, um, but um, uh, less of that overactivation in immunotype two, and then a third immunotype where there's very little activation of the adaptive immune response. And I think this has potential implications for different treatments. So even when these immunotype three patients are present uh, later in disease course, perhaps these patients still might be patients you want to reserve treatment with dexamethasone because we're, we really don't have an active adaptive immune response. But that's uh, a little bit of speculation on my part. So the last question I wanted to address is what happens in these pediatric patients when they don't get severe disease or in the pediatric patients that present with this MIS-C uh, presentation that Dr. Fauci mentioned, this multi-inflammatory syndrome of children. 
And so we did the same thing and built a pediatric cohort with our colleagues at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, uh, 30 patients, uh, half of whom had this Miss C presentation uh, for the pediatric world. This is a fairly uh, large cohort, even though it's small by, by most standards. Uh, what we saw is that in the pediatric patients, we had some level of T cell activation using some of the same criteria. But in fact, these Miss C children had much more activation of their T cell compartment than did the non Miss C COVID patients, um, uh, pediatric COVID patients. And in fact, the Miss C children had T cell activation that rivaled our most severely ill adult patients, sometimes uh, at the highest end of that spectrum. You could do the same thing where you project these data onto this landscape map of immune responses, and you can convince yourself that perhaps in the area of immunotype three, there are fewer of these Miss C patients, the triangles now in this case, and perhaps some of the acute respiratory distress that we see in children maps to this immunotype three area, or at least low immunotype two, right, component two. What is interesting about the Miss C patients is actually they seem to resolve their symptoms very quickly. And in fact, that's the clinical experience that while Miss C presentation is quite scary initially, the patients recover very, very rapidly. And in fact, in a, in a handful of patients, we have blood draws about a week apart. And you can see that this immune this T cell activation in Miss C is very robust at the first blood draw but is uh, returning towards baseline, actually close to baseline by the second draw. And that correlates, um, or at least is associated with a decrease in clinical measures of disease severity, including uh, CRP and, and procalcitonin levels in these patients. And just the last point I wanna make is an observation we made because of this uh, deep profiling platform, the identification of a cell type uh, that seems very interesting and perhaps is connected to some of the uh, immune connections to thrombosis that, that Adam talked about a few minutes ago. And so this is this uh, population of CD8 T cells that expresses the chemokine receptor CX3CR1. This chemokine receptor recognizes a chemokine CX3CL1, and this axis is quite interesting to consider in this case. Uh, this axis has a role in myeloid cells and mostly cytotoxic lymphocytes, including CD8 T cells and K cells and a couple of other types of cells. This chemokine receptor is uh, expressed by CD8 T cells that are involved in patrolling the vasculature. And in fact, the chemokine itself is upregulated and expressed in an interesting way by activated endothelium. These CD8 T cells that are marked by this chemokine receptor are also more cytotoxic and often more terminally differentiated. And in fact, this chemokine receptor axis and chemokine axis has a clear role in cardiovascular disease and atherosclerosis where um, genetic variants in this pathway actually are associated with disease. Now, the number or the frequency of this population of cells expressing this chemokine receptor is not different across disease, whether it's in adults or in children. However, what we see, especially in the Miss C patients, is a dramatically elevated activation of T cells expressing this chemokine receptor. So in Miss C, you see almost half of the circulating CD8 T cells that express this chemokine receptor uh, express these activation markers, or you can do this by other activation markers compared to the pediatric COVID patients where it's only about 10 to 15%. And you can see this being robustly different uh, in the CX3 CR1 positive cells uh, in the C patients. Now we wanted to ask whether this had any relationship to disease presentation, disease manifestation. And so what we did is ask whether there was a relationship between the activation state of these chemokine receptor positive T cells and the need for a physician to treat with vasoactive medication. And in fact, regardless of whether the presentation was a Miss C or non Miss C patient, there was a much higher likelihood of treatment with vasoactive medication if there was a high percentage of these activated CX3CR1 positive cir circulating CD8 T cells. We wanted to ask whether the pediatric setting actually gave us any insights into adults. And in fact, did a very similar analysis. And there's again a relationship. Uh, numbers are a little bit better here, but still a little bit on the low side. But if patients have a high percentage of activated CX3 CR1 positive CD8 T cells, they're more likely to have clot complication during their time in the hospital. So let me just summarize very quickly. I won't read through all of this, but just make a couple of points that we see tremendous clinical and immune heterogeneity in COVID-19 patients that manifests in the type and, and um, features of activated CD4 and CD8 T cells. There's a massive plasma blast response rivaling what we see in acute Ebola and dengue infection, although we don't know the specificity of that response yet. Some of this immune activation is incredibly stable over time. Some of these patients have activated T or B cells for many weeks longer than you see in typical acute viral infection. We think that some of the immune features might actually give us um, 
insights into how to treat patients with different drugs, although that requires direct testing. And then we identified this unusual, um, or this, this uh, CX3, CR1 positive CD8 T cell that might be vascular patrolling, and it found it associated with the pathogenesis of MIS C in, in children, and that led to potential insights in adults uh, related to the cell type. So we think this kind of immune profiling might allow us to identify links between the way the immune system is behaving and the way we may want to test different treatments in SARS-CoV-2 uh, patients, COVID-19 patients. So all of this work was done by a really amazing team. There were seven co-first authors on the adult work that I, that I mentioned, including Divich, Josephine, Amy, Ali, Jen, Cecile, and Derek. We have an enormous clinical team. Uh, Nula Meyer really was the catalyst to that. Clinical coordination by a large group of people uh, in our group and elsewhere, uh, and especially at CHOP with help from Ed Behrens, who really helped um, uh, nucleate a lot of these efforts, and Sarah Hendrickson, who helped with the cohort development. Uh, Mike Betts was instrumental, and we built a COVID processing unit that, that I can't go without mentioning with people that were volunteering throughout the pandemic to contribute to sample processing uh, and workflow. So I'll stop there. Thank you for your attention and I uh, look forward to questions a little bit later. Thank you so much, John. That was um, really enlightening and um, congratulations to you and your team for completing this research in record time.